Brilliant. Thank you. Right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Schools Forum. My name's David Jeeps, and I'll be chairing today's meeting. Um, please be aware, members of the public are invited to view this meeting online, and the meeting is recorded. We're meeting virtually in response to limitations placed on governance by the COVID-19 pandemic. The City Solicitor has advised that pursuant to Section 78 of the Coronavirus Act 2020, this meeting will be run by reference to the model standing orders as set out in the local authorities coronavirus flexibility of local authority meetings regulation 2020 number 392. Forum members are requested to keep their microphones on mute and to only turn these on when you are called to speak. If you have any questions or comments to make on the reports, please use the chat functions and simply write RTS, RTS request to speak. And I just now need to do a bit of a roll call. So um, in terms of the attendance, do we have Matthew McLaughlin Parker? Um, no. Do we have Jackie Collins? Yes. Yes, Dave, Dave Jones, yes, and I know Dave's got some technical issues, so we'll be uh, using the chat functions. Dave Jeeps, obviously present. Cher Dool, is Cher with us? Yes, I'm here, yep. Thank yes, you, I Cher. Am. Jason Crouch, I know, is with us, and I know, Jason, you've got to leave at 17.40. Joe Cooper, I can see, so welcome, Joe. Sean Preston, is Sean with us? Yep, I'm here, thank you. Thank you, welcome. Nathan, I can see Nathan, yeah. welcome. Oh, Niz, do we have Niz? Okay, Steve Labatz, is Steve here? Um, Sharon Burt, I'm here. Is here, thank you, Sharon. I think Councillor Horton, you are here observing. Indeed, I am. Hello. Oh. Good afternoon, Councillor Horton. We have Cla Councillor Claire Udi. Hello, how are you? Hello, I'm yeah, here. Very well, Claire, welcome. Um, Councillor Judith Smythe. You can see a camera there, Judith, so I'm going to put her down as not present for the minute, and then I'm sure she'll dial in. Uh, Councillor Lynn Stagg. Yes, I'm here. Hi, uh, welcome, Lynn. Councillor Terry Norton. Hi, David. Yes, I am here, but um, like Councillor Horton, I'm going to stay in an uh, observing capacity because I've got another meeting, so I'll drop in and out if that's okay. Absolutely, and thank you for your time. It's Simon Barrable. Yes, I'm here, David. Hi, everyone. Hi, Simon. And Cara, I've already said good afternoon to but nevertheless good afternoon Cara welcome so <laughs> um so I'll just go through do we have Matthew McLaughlin Parker Niz Steve Jones. yeah I'm I'm here David uh, wait, uh, Steve's here brilliant Steve is here and I can see Councillor Smythe is with us as well. And who else do we have? We've obviously got Alison Edgerton from Local Authority, Lisa Gallagher, Debbie Anderson, and I'm guessing Angela Mann from Local Authority, as well as Mindy Butler, who will be presenting later. Alison Jeffrey, welcome. Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, Sam Galloway, is that right? I'm joining as an observer. Super, welcome Sam. And Mike Stoneman, welcome Mike. If I haven't called your name out and you're present, do you want to make yourself known via the chat? Right, okay. Off we go then for another exciting instalment. So we'll kick off with apologies. Uh, Alison, do we have any apologies? I've not received any apologies. Brilliant. 
And Julia Catherine, welcome, Julia. Um, thank you for that. Right, declarations of interest. I believe there is only one outstanding. Yes, uh, that's for Simon Barabel. And to say he's only just received that, so I'm, ex I'm sure he will get that to us as soon as, he's pos as, soon as possible. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay. Right. Membership changes. Now, I will jump in before we do the, uh, the, the, the main bulk of the changes. And just uh, we have Steve Labatt's leaving us. Um, the, the, the escape tunnel is now fully dug. Um, so uh, well done, Steve. So I think 14 years on forum. Is that, is that the, uh, the, the total? 14 years continuous another four years before that uh, oh, with a break when i did escape but then i got pulled back in yeah. well just it's like a whirlpool deep, you can't get out and well indeed well deep thanks steve just, not just from four but i know so many educational communities and and, com and committees and meetings and certainly my in my few years at, at portsmouth you have been um, a giant in the educational landscape so uh Whilst on one hand, we, um, you know, you'll be greatly missed. On the other hand, of course, Steve, you know, very well earned next chapter. And uh, thank you for what you've done for Forum. Good luck. And uh, any other changes, though, Alison? Yes. Um, so we have, as I say, Steve is leaving us. So from my point of view, again, thank you, Steve. Uh, your role on Schools Forum has been extremely helpful over recent years when I've been working with you. Um, there's also Matthew McLaughlin Parker. This is his last meeting as the Harbour School will be convert to academy status on the 1st of January 2021. And I would also like to take this opportunity to thank him for his input into this forum. I'd like to thank Simon Barabel for standing again as the post-16 representative for the city. Uh, we currently have five vacancies within the forum. That's three secondary academy representatives and two primary representatives. Um, as previously stated, academy representatives do not need to be head teachers and could be undertaken by any role within the trust. Um, I would really appreciate it if some if we could get some academy volunteers and I've asked Mike uh, Stoneman and Alison Jeffrey if they could raise this at the next meeting they have with the multi-academy trusts and um, that's it with regards to membership changes. Brilliant. I don't know if I mentioned but Julia Catherine I can see join the meeting as well so welcome to Julia. Right, um, item number four is the minutes of the previous meeting. Um, so um, where are we with the minutes of the previous meeting? So we need to ensure that this is a correct record of the meeting held on the 16th of September. Um, I'll just go through the, a page at a time just so that people are happy. If you're not, then RTS in the chat, please. So um, looking at the first page, which is labeled confusingly page five. Everyone happy that's accurate? Page six, everyone happy? That's an accurate record. Page seven, page eight, and page nine. So is everyone, well, we'll put it this way, does anyone, would anyone like to um, correct that, those minutes? Okay, so we'll take that as an accurate reflection of our meeting. Now, I believe there were some outstanding items. So, um, Alison, do you want to just fill us in on the matters arising? Yes, there was one outstanding um, item with regards to the COVID-19 um, grant. Uh, I did say at the last meeting that we had a meeting coming up with the Department for Education along with another uh, uh, other finance offices across the southeast. Uh, unfortunately, the meeting that we had with the DFE was the same day as the spending review, and therefore they weren't able to confirm anything 
um, in right, you know, at that meeting to see whether there were any additional grants for schools. However, on Friday the 27th, there was a press release stating that there would be some funding with regards to staff absences. Uh, the guidance hasn't yet been published, uh, but from that press release, they were talking that there could be some additional funding where there are large numbers of absences in schools and where schools have used up any reserves down to about 4% of their annual income and the absence rates were above 20% on a short-term basis or 10% on a long-term basis, sorry, and or 10%. As we receive any further guidance and more detail, we'll be passing that on to schools. That's great. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. And I, I remember last meeting there was there was a lot of sort of concern about the impact of COVID on school finances. So it's uh, good to hear that there might be some money in the system to meet those costs. Therefore, if that's the only action, therefore I think we can approve the minutes as accurate and move on to agenda item five. And I think Alison, you're going to walk us through that one. Is that okay? Yes, that's fine. Uh, just one second, I'll get my notes up. Okay, so with regard to agenda item five, this is the re regular report that sets out the dedicated schools grant forecast position for the 2021 financial year as at the 30th of September 2020. Overall, the dedicated schools grant is forecasting an underspend of 1.4 million, the reasons for which are identified in the report. However, I'd like to draw your attention just to a couple of areas. One is the growth fund, uh, which is forecasting a planned underspend of 284,000. A consultation with schools closed on Friday the 13th of November and the school funding arrangements report on the agenda sets out the proposal to carry forward the balance on this budget for use on 20, in 2021, sorry, 21-22 financial year. Uh, the early years uh, budget there is an underspend on that and there is a proposal regarding the use of that underspend uh, and that's been brought to a sep in a separate report to this meeting um, which schools forum will be asked to review uh, just going through at the end of September we had made payments relating to the high needs setting and class lists um, and all the early years providers for the summer term and we'd also made initial payments for the autumn term. Forecasts within the report are based on actual payments and the projected changes to pupil numbers based on our 1920, so yeah, uh, sorry, I'll put my teeth in, 2019 activity for both the high needs and the early years. There has been lower than expected expenditure for the summer term, in particular in some of the high needs budgets. And this has potentially been linked to the national lockdown which potentially has reduced the number of pupils who have moved between settings or may have requested an EHCP assessment. It is an area that we are looking at and keeping a close eye on over the course of the autumn term and we'll be obviously reporting back to Schools Forum and any changes with regards to that in future. The net position provides a forecast carry forward of 4.6 million as at the end of September 20 and table 8 in the report sets out the potential impact on outstanding decisions on that carry forward balance. It is recommended that Schools Forum notes the forecast year end position along with the explanations in the report and I'm happy to take any questions. Not, not, not some, thank you, um, Alison. Not so much a question, but just to understand a little bit more um, about the the underspend. So, looks like it's two areas: the EHCPs and the yeah. outer city placements. Do you want to just tell us a little bit more about those, Alison, and sort of what the thinking might be going forward? Yeah. Um, so, as at the end of September. Uh, what we noticed, particularly over the summer term, was there was a kind of a flurry of activity with the mainstream schools, EHCPs, to, at the beginning, stroke into the middle of the term. But then, obviously, the numbers reduced with regards to the, the national lockdown. Um, we're not too sure whether that is because children were being, uh, weren't in school and therefore weren't being identified um, we think potentially this may pick up over the course of the academic year, um, but because of the time scale with uh, setting up an EHCP, 
we don't think financially that will hit until the 21-22 financial year. Mm. So if there is any understanding in this financial year, that would be carried forward as part of our year-end balances and then could support any increase that we may have we may see in next financial year mm. uh, it's a similar story probably with the out of city providers um, where we potentially there may not have been as much movement between providers or with children being placed in uh, provision over the course of the summer term um, in particular we've seen a, redu a reduction in the number of children placed uh, within the uh, child and adolescent mental health service mm. but I think Julia might be able to provide a little bit more information uh, regarding the background to what's happening with the EHCPs. Yeah, that'd be great. Ju Julia do you want to just uh, cut in here for us please? Yep absolutely so um, it's because uh, for um, normally for a request for an education health and care plan um, schools would be required to provide two terms worth of evidence so obviously over the summer term, a number of children weren't in school and so it wasn't possible to collect that evidence. And similarly, if um, requests to the HCP are being requested as part of an annual review process, again, schools are collecting evidence in order to inform that. Um, so if children were um, out of school um, over the summer term, then obviously that would have had an impact on, on that. So it doesn't mean there's been no activity, but there's been a, um, a reduction over the yeah, no, that's help. That's helpful to understand. Jason, yeah, maybe just picking up on that a little further, Alison and Julia. It's pleasing to hear that that money is being retained for use. Is there anything we can be thinking on in terms of not just using that to handle the backlog, but it boosts whether it's only temporarily the ability to assess those claims? Because parents, I know, are frustrated on the, the length of time it takes, and with this added lockdown, it's just increasing that time frame. Is there anything else we can do with that money aside from just keeping it there to? Um, review the backlog but increase the support we give given so that backlog timeline can be reduced further? Um, in terms of time scales, we um, are pretty much 100% within the statutory time scales in Portsmouth. Um, so um, we, we, there's no delays in terms of assessments. Um, we have been discussing with schools um, and the feedback we've had from SENCOs um, when we met with them this term was that they um, uh, we should expect to see a, a, an increase. You know, it, in effect, there's a bit of a backlog that they're now working through. Um, so we're continuing to support SENCOs in um, putting that, pulling that evidence together and submitting it. But the actual assessments, there's no delays with those. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, points of clarification? I mean, I suppose my... I don't think I've ever known the high needs block to be underspent. So it's a very unusual position we, we find ourselves in. Um, I, I, I suppose the concern is that, you know, I think you're quite right, Julia and Alison, in, in what you're saying. And one one thinks there might be a bit of a, uh, uh, a kind of uh, uh, quite a lot of coming through the system, as it were, in the next couple of terms. So uh, I'm sure this is going to come back to us in future meetings. Any other questions before we move on? Right, um, I've been asked to just tweak the order, um, and that, and, and uh, therefore, what we're what, what's being proposed is that the next item we look at is item number seven. Um, uh, that's right, isn't it? So we're looking. Um, at uh, the paper, um, I think, is Mindy going to take us through that? Is that the plan? Yeah, hi there. Hi, okay. Mindy. Hello. Um, so, this is um, an early year's request um, for the purpose of the report is to get additional funding in the form of a one-off grant um, to support the sustainability of the early years market. Um, it applies to all providers across the city who offer funded early years provision for two, three and four year olds, uh, regardless of whether or not they were able to open during the first coronavirus lockdown. Um, so what we are asking is for you to endorse uh, the grant values of £2,700 for early years settings and £500 for childminders. 
Um, this would reflect the extra costs of overhead staffing and numbers of children in nurseries and preschools um, in comparison with childminders who work from home and care for less children. Um, the early years sector, um, it's well noted at the moment, is experiencing many financial challenges uh, as a result of the pandemic. And the early years team have been working hard over the past few months to ensure sufficiency and sustainability for our providers, um, both now and in the future. Many of our settings stayed open during the first lockdown to provide childcare for critical worker children and vulnerable children. Um, and some settings were unable to remain open due to the nature of the building that their business is run from. Um, some had a number of staff who were shielding and some had children at home or, un or were unable to open for other reasons. All Portsmouth early years providers were paid in full on their forecast task at the beginning of April 2020 and some received business rate relief where it was applicable. Any setting that actually de delivered over and above the hours paid to them on their forecast were paid for these additional hours at the end of the summer term. Um, however, significant financial challenges have been faced by the sector through the loss of private fees due to low numbers of children attending in the summer and at the beginning of the autumn term. The numbers of children attending early year settings is now increasing. Um, however, many settings this term have had to close due to positive coronavirus cases and this again has impacted on their private fee income. Um, also to be noted is that many parents have changed their working patterns and they no longer need childcare for a full working day mm. um, and some who are working from home are choosing to keep their children with them to keep their costs down. Mm. Um, there have also been increased running costs since the pandemic began in the form of requiring extra staff um, in order that bubbles of children could be maintained with no staff crossover and also for extra staff and time to manage the infection control guidelines um, and also the significant cost of the extra cleaning fluid that needs to be applied on a daily basis. Um, so during this autumn term we funded providers as advised by the DfE as if t autumn 20 was happening normally. Um, in order to do this, we paid providers based on their indicative budget using autumn 2019 hours. Mm. Um, we know that 23 providers across the city have had significantly lower numbers this year than last year, and therefore this approach has actually helped them to remain sufficient for this term. Uh, next term, we'll be paying based uh, on the headcount task as usual. We haven't heard anything from the DfE to contradict that so far. Um, and some settings who haven't seen a significant increase in numbers may find themselves with a, a, a much lower income in January than in previous years. Um, over the past few months, we have engaged HempSource um, early as consultants to engage with our providers and offer business support. Um, Advice has been given to the providers to help them change their business models and help them maximise occupancy. And the support's been really well received and many settings have started to implement some of these business models to their provision. Um, over 50% of providers participated in this and um, expressed to us some concern over their future sufficiency. So really, this, this grant would support future sufficiency, give an extra boost to the continued recovery um, of the sector moving into 21 and would enable our early years providers to be able to continue to support working parents and our most vulnerable children in Portsmouth um, and also for them to continue to receive such an important and valuable start to their early years education. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, just a couple from me. Uh, well, firstly, an observation. Obviously, I think that your points about working patterns changing quickly is, is very well made, and, and, and uh, early years are going to feel that um, instantly. And it'll be interesting to see post COVID whether those patterns continue. But in terms of the grants, £2,700 for preschools and nurseries, does it depend on the size or is that a, a, a one-off amount? Is that the proposal, just a one-off? Yeah, it's, it's a one-off amount, um, largely because the the biggest costs tend to be for obviously the rent of the building, the staffing costs, okay. um, and we just think that the, the smaller providers as well as the larger providers are all suffering the, the same issues at the moment. So we decided a, a straight one-off payment to everyone would be very welcome. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, 
And is there a sense that that's enough? I mean, people always want more, but... <laughs> Um, well, yeah, I mean, I think in our sector at the moment, you know, before uh, the pandemic, you know, there were there were issues with sustainability and sufficiency. So I think anything at the moment would be welcome. I think so far this term they've had the, uh, those that have needed it have had the boost from having the indicative payment from last year. And, you know, for some that has given them a, a considerable cash boost this this term to keep them going. So um, I think I think it will really help. I think it will pay for those extra costs that that are so significant at the moment, um, mm. you know, to replace staff who, who've had to go off if they're self-isolating. And as I say, the infection control um, is is really a significant extra cost that hasn't been factored in uh, across the sector. Okay, Alison, you've got your hand up. Yes, I, I just really wanted to clarify uh, from the uh, the grants point of view that with regards to the types of providers, we can we can't pay the same type of provider a different amount. So we have to pay that whole sector the same amount. Uh, we can't oh. differentiate under the regulations. Okay, that's that's helpful. Thank you for that clarification. Um, any other questions, observations? So if I can say, David, that obviously money in early years is very tight, as I've said many a time, um, mm. I do feel this would be a welcome amount for the early years. But again, for some businesses, I don't think it will touch their sustainability. Mm. So I think we need to be really careful. I, yeah, I agree. I, I, I have to say that uh, of, of all the all the parts of the education system, early years um, is probably going to go through quite a transformation in, in the next sort of 12, 24 months. With, as new working habits and patterns are established, um, it's something I think that, again, is going to come back to this group um, in the future. Um, but it, is, it feels like the right thing to do to, to make a grant. Um, and what I think we are being asked to do is to endorse um, those values and also um, note that a further review of the DSG um, early years block funding expenditure will be undertaken. Is, is that correct, Mindy? Yes, it is. Yes, thank you. So um, in terms of uh, voting, um, Alison, um, how do we, I think the this is a vote for everyone gets to vote on this. So if we take it as a block to endorse a note, is that OK? That's OK. Yes, everybody's able to vote. Um, and so what I'll need in a second, so uh, button, you know, fingers on the buzzers, as it were, is I will need a, a proposer um, for the approval of the recommendations and also a seconder. So I shall pause as per my script. So, Councillor Sorry, Councilor David. Um, Sorry. I don't know whether you've realised uh, Councillor Judith Smythe has her hand up. I've just just seen that. So thank you, Judith. She's proposing. And a seconder is... OK, so um, Cher Dull is going to uh, second. Thank you. So we have a proposer and a seconder. So the recommendation has been proposed and seconded. I will now take the vote by affirmation of the meeting as permitted within the regulations. If there is no dissent, the proposal is passed. Are there any objectors to the recommendations? If you wish to object, please RTS in the chat function. Right, good. That's carried then, so thank you all. So we'll now jump to what is on your paperwork. Oh, I've got an RTS there, Judith, sorry. Um, I was very happy to propose that, but what I wanted to say is um, how closely are we keeping the state of the market in early years under uh, study, and do we know... Um, how many have had to close down already? I mean, uh, good quality early years education is absolutely crucial for the future, and we'll see the impact in schools in uh, three, two, one, two, and three years' time if uh, there are real problems. How, how much do we know? And I wonder if it's worth 
the next school forum having a report about this or uh, it, uh, looking at it globally because I know it's, it's a sector that's been under great strain nationally and I'm sure we're no except well but as you, what you've said we're under we're no exception there so we've had um, three settings who have closed um, by the end of the summer um, who had sufficiency problems anyway and we have one more um, that we think will probably have to close in April unless their numbers uh, really increase. Um, last year I wrote the um, sufficiency report for early years in Portsmouth and we were in a really good position. Um, what's good to note is that for all of the settings that close we have got some bigger providers that want to open other settings. So it seems that at the moment um, we've got a lot of interest even though the, the market is is um, very insecure at the moment. We've got a lot of interest of people actually wanting to to open early years settings. So I will be writing the sufficiency report again in March and um, hope to have some updates on that. But, but at the moment, we're keeping a really close eye on it. We're in contact with all of our providers on a regular basis. They're coming to us for lots of business support. Um, and I don't feel at the moment that we're in a position where if settings close, we won't have other people coming forward to open. So at the moment, I think it's looking just about OK. <laughs> okay. I, I think you implied that earlier on. I mean, I think I think it is important that providers look at the new, slightly different working arrangements that are going to go on after COVID, more working at home, more need for flexibility um, and more need for perhaps some slightly different um, routines when it comes to early years care. Yeah, the um, the business support that we've been taking from Hempsels, um, they very much focused on um, business remodelling for for early years and looking at how um, how they can change their hours and sort of um, take more funding and just be a little bit more um, creative in their thinking about how they how they operate. So some of our settings already are starting to implement those things. So we'll we'll have to monitor that and see how it goes. Thank you, and I think thank Cara. You very much. Thank you for elaborating that. Okay, welcome. Um, thanks, Mindy. So, and Cara, did you want to uh, add something before we move yeah, on? Yeah, I just don't feel it's fair to say that there are new settings opening that will take the place of existing providers. Um, we've got some outstanding providers and some providers who've got years of educational experience that are at risk of closure, and I am very concerned that the attitude at the moment seems to be well, we've got a sufficiency issue, but we'll just replace them. We need no, that to be careful that we are not losing expertise in early years. I absolutely agree, Cara, and that's not what I meant at all. That I mean, we the thing is, is that we have the settings that have closed. If we could keep them open, we would have done. Um, and obviously, we're trying really hard with all the extra business support to, um, to, to keep our providers that are open. But, you know, we do have also a lot of people standing in the wings, some, some who aren't even existing providers, but people who are looking for spaces to open up. So if the worst comes to the worst, which we hope it doesn't, because as you say, we've got really good um, providers across the city, then, you know, that that's at least in terms of um, being able to accommodate all of our working parents and vulnerable children, we, we, we do have options. But obviously, our intention is to keep our, our settings that we have um, sufficient, which hence the grant. Which I do respect, but I do feel we just need to have it minuted that there are settings out there who've not been eligible for any financial support yeah. throughout COVID. And this is a very small grant that they will get. And actually, some of them are really struggling and working huge amounts of hours for free to try and keep their businesses sustainable. Thank, thank you, Cara. I, you know, I think we all concur that, you know, this is a, you know, a, a very key part of the educational landscape, as uh, Judith said. Um, it's, it's vital children get that great start to, to their educational journey. Um, so, um, and, I'm, and I think the point which was very well made by Judith about having a flexible approach, um, there will be new ways of working. Um, and uh, families will find themselves um, uh, working differently, working, um, you know, much more from home probably going forward. And, and, and the sector, I, I sense, has a challenge there to to quickly adapt to this to this new landscape. That said, what we do know about education, the educational landscape in the city is 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 um we we adapt very quickly um you know and uh i'm you know i'm, I'm confident that, that that they will 
but yeah, it'll be great to hear a, f a follow up report in, in you know, in 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 the future meeting, Mindy, um, yeah. particularly around the question of sufficiency. Um, and and, and it, I, I'd personally be very interested to to hear a bit more about how um, settings are embracing the, the the new world post COVID, whatever that looks like. Okay, so if everyone's happy, what we'll do then is move on to what is now going to be item seven, which is the school funding arrangement for 2021-2022. Um, Angela, I think you're going to walk us through that one. And uh, we, at the end of it, we'll be noting, um, hopefully, and then, uh, well, two notes and an endorse, no, sorry, three endorsements and, and a couple of notes. So, uh, um, Angela, over to you. Thanks, David. Um, so in terms of the report, it is um, updating you on the um, the guidance from the high needs block and asking for an endorsement of the um, proposals. Um, the mainstream education, health and care plan and banding and it also um, contains information about the consultation regarding the proposed carry forward of the growth fund and it also asks for the endorsement of the proposal for the carry forward of the growth fund um, as required and finally the report asks for the endorsement of the rates for the early year providers um, for 21-22 so the information is in the report um, but just to say that at the moment the indicative funding for the high needs block is an increase of 12.7 percent um, but we do think that um, this will change slightly as um, the DfE has confirmed that they've only been able to Angela can I just stop you um, you're breaking up quite a lot can I suggest you switch off your camera uh, just to see if it can stabilise some of the internet? information? Because the, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, can you hear me any better now? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, right. Um, I, hopefully you've heard. I was just reiterating what the re um, report was for but in terms so in terms of the high needs block um, the indicative funding um, shows an increase of 12.7% um, but we we know that it doesn't include all all of um, the things um, because they had to take I think they took um, information from July and so it excludes some information of allocation and it's not that it's just been um, excluded and um, the main thing for the high needs block um, has been the change to include the teachers paying pensions grants um, as set out in table one um, which is similar to the schools block um, but the way that that money will be um, passed on to um, the, the um, special schools is that it will be given as an additional grant and it won't actually affect the place or top up funding for those um, for those schools in terms of the information on the um, consultation that went to schools um, table 2 summarises the responses that we've had from the schools um, there was one query regarding um, the change to IDACI in terms of the schools block and the response is in um, paragraph 6.5 and the school has been contacted um, and the impact explained to them which is that if it's if it becomes an, um, a negative impact then the minimum funding guarantee um, would compensate for that in terms of um, the mainstream health and care plans and the responses are set out in appendix two um, and paragraph 6.8 to 6.14 in the report um, is um, the responses to those and 
in the light of um, the comments and the responses, um, it's not proposed to make any changes to the banding criteria um, as set out in a briefing document um, that went to the schools. Um, and um, the banding values will be brought to school for in, in January 2021 in addition. In terms of the um, consultation for carrying forward um, the growth fund balances that uh, to the four schools that um, responded, they all agreed with the proposal and therefore it is proposed to carry forward the balance to 21-22. Moving on to early years, we are still waiting guidance um, regarding the early years block and that will be brought to schools forum and cabinet member um, for children, families and education um, along with any changes to the rates once we have that. Until that time um, we're proposing endorsement of the rates as in table 5 of the report. I don't know whether anybody's got any questions on the funding report. Um, right, uh, I've got not so much a question but a challenge um, when we look at the number of responses received which is four out of a potential 61 um, it's it's very you know it's disappointing um, I wonder really if, if if anyone's got any views on how we can sort of better engage um, you know, particularly the academy sector. Um, you know, you know, you know. It's uh, it's a real shame that you know we've got zero responses from from that part of the the the, the, the landscape. Um, it, and I know it's difficult because I think COVID's made everything um, very stretched and, and and all the rest of it. But uh, it, I suppose, my my question here is. Can we? How can we get you know more responses back into our into our consultations? Um, but that's really a sort of a, a rhetorical question, I suppose. I leave that one there. Right, Sean. Um, is Sean uh, uh, wishing to make a comment? Yeah, just a quick question really, just um, obviously you uh, reference MFG within the document, um, I just wanted to clarify, subject to affordability is the intention that is set at the 2% that's stipulated within the national funding formula and if the um, final allocation that comes through from the DfE is not affordable in terms of a full national funding formula, is the intention to reduce the MFG down to below 2% um, because if it is there may be differing options we can look at to ensure all schools receive their full national funding formula um, so that's just a question I wanted to ask. Uh, Angela do you want to, are you in a position to ask that one? Um, yes so in terms of um, we brought the paper on the um, process that we'd go through for the schools block um, last time um, and so we said that once we had the um, final allocation, we would look to um, changing the um, area cost adjustment first. And after that, we would um, be um, looking at uh, managing the affordability um, through the MFG. So, so once we know the full impact of the IDACI, um, then it would be the area cost adjustment and the minimum funding guarantee that we would look at adjusting. I mean, because um, we've gone with the national funding formula, there's not a lot in that, you know, to distribute all the funding to the schools. Thank you. Sean, did you want to follow up? Yes, please. That's OK. Yeah. Um, so I think it's, again, important, in my opinion, that um, all schools should receive their full national funding formula as far as is possible subject to affordability. And I would just like to put out an option on the table um, in the eventuality that there isn't enough funding so that all schools can receive their national funding formula, that potentially the excess funding in the growth pot could be utilised to support that allocation so that all schools receive their full national funding formula as an option to be discussed if that eventuality occurs, just to put that on the table really. 
I'm, re I'm really sure, and I think you echo um, a number a number of forum members over the years have have urged for some options on the table for us to consider. Um, and so, I, what I would like to task um, Andrew and Alison with is um, as 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 much as possible. And we do understand that sometimes um, the the announcements are made very late, but as much as possible. Um, to give members um, of this group opportunities to look at different options and weigh them up and, 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 and sort of make decisions, um, I think is, is the, you know, the key thrust of, of that point. And it's one I would absolutely um, support. Thank you for your comment there, Sharon. Um, good, good, good yeah. thinking. Alison, did you want to respond? Yeah, Sorry, uh, with regards to uh, coming back with options, the one issue we have is timescales. Uh, we're not no normally not notified of our funding until that last week of the school term. Mm. Obviously, that funding then has to go through our model to make sure we understand what the affordability issues are. We then have coming back to schools forum on the 13th of January with any proposals uh, with regards to the the changes and we then need to notify the DfE of what the school's budget will be by the, I think it's the 21st of January next year. So our timing is very tight, yeah. um, which is why we agree the proposals with regards to trying to tackle the area cost adjustment and the minimum funding guarantee is the areas we will look at with regards to affordability. As I've said previously, our current growth fund does require some of the, the carry forward there to support that in future years and we have made commitments to those schools that have increased their numbers particularly in the secondary sector uh, to support them with managing the lag in the funding for that obviously when we get our account allocation through the growth funding that we are predicting to receive is has a potential for being higher and that's purely because of the way that the funding allocation to authorities works. If that is the case, then we are able to put additional funding back into the individual schools' budgets and maximise the use of the MFG as much as possible. Okay. I'm just noting on the chat, um, thank you, Alison, um, on the chat, Mike Stoneman's uh, good suggestion. And, and, and he, he has reminded us that last year we did have some brief, dedicated briefings um, and, and perhaps in the interests of getting more participation, we should look at doing that in the future, having these sort of online briefings um, available to talk people through consultation documents and, uh, and have workshops straight after to get responses. I think that's a really good idea, Mike. And... Uh, I think Alison um, and Anja, can we uh, consider that um, for future consultations? Yes. Um, <laughs> sorry, uh, David. In terms of um, going back as well um, to sort of the growth funding, um, we sort of had this discussion at the last school forum and um, I mean the MFG will be between half percent and the two percent as per the national um, pillar and um, so you know and it wasn't endorsed um, by schools forum um, last time and mm. and we got cabinet member approval for it mm. um, and and likewise in terms of the, the growth fund um, we've gone out to consultation about carrying that forward um, and obviously schools forum have still got to dis decide on the endorsement of that in this meeting mm. um, but but there's um, so f for this year we have we have had the endorsement to um, flex the MFG after the um, area cost adjustment yeah no that's that is understood no and I, and I do I, I, I do understand that time time is is difficult which is why you sequence things as you do um, but I suppose the spirit behind the the question or the challenge on the table is that you know forum members want you know as much as is practicable some options to look at um, you know and, and that's been the case for a while it's not 
not a new thing and that's what we'd urge you to work towards yeah. um, and, and and the other thing to note though is that anything that we've got in the growth funding is really one off and, mm. and so that's the other thing one off funding for a recurring nature and okay. um, so those are the things that need to be balanced but you know happy to work with um, anybody um, and like you say in terms of um, engagement and perhaps you know the the meetings again might um, you know encourage more engagement in the consultations that we do yeah. I mean is there a an appetite around the the, the, the the forum at the moment for um, to take up Alison uh, Andrew's invite that, that a small group maybe work with officers I, I we, we, we wouldn't be able to do it for this year um, no. because okay. well because schools forums already endorsed the approach that we're going to take for distributing the funding yeah no but um, going but going forward yes okay but going forward that's something we could facilitate um sean yeah sorry just to clarify in terms of what i was suggesting there it wasn't necessarily putting options as to how to distribute the funding the point i was trying to make was that if the full national funding formula is stipulated by the dfe is not affordable that actually we need to look at number one can we make it affordable which could be done by diverting some growth funding whilst I fully understand the rationale behind keeping it for future years there are other options it wasn't about necessarily looking at different options about how the funding is distributed because I am very much a supporter of the national funding formula being distributed out as fully as is possible as stipulated by the DfE so just to clarify it's not necessarily looking at options it's looking at affordability around ensuring schools receive as much as their national funding formula as is possible so just to clarify Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you. Uh, and 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 they will because then what happens then is that the minimum funding guarantee um, then adds to that to make um, you know schools get at least half percent increase for the pupils that they've got. Um, so, but it, it's just once we got all the facts we know the funding that's coming in it's actually a funding guarantee um, but I'm happy, you know, we, we can talk about it outside this meeting to ensure if that's easier yeah I think again it's just it's just being it's being very clear that the DfE are stipulating that the national funding formula stipulates that all schools will receive 2% MFG as a minimum and if we move against that and reduce that down because of affordability that means that those schools will not receive their full national funding formula it's just to be clear and, and very open and transparent with that fact that's all I, I believe the DfE guidance is that it's at least half a percent and up to two percent um, so that's the guidance and that's what we'll be working um, to Okay. Um, well, it would be it would be important just to clarify this two percent. Um, uh, I'm not I'm not that familiar with so familiar with the guidance that I could I could answer that one. So, um, do you want to just you know double check the, what the guidance says, Angela, just so we've got that clarity? And uh, I take on I take shares. Um, you know, very sensible suggestion that if we are going to have a small group working more closely with um, officers, we do need to, um, uh, you know, get volunteers in early. Um, rather than put Angela and Alison on the spot in the meeting, what I would suggest as a way forward is we let them consider um, for next year how how, what, how that might look and how imp more more targeted input from forum members could support them and and come back to us at, at the next meeting with a, with a plan does that seem reasonable Angela um, the next meeting's going to be in January so ideally I'd like to talk about yes. it in the, the meeting if possible. So, Okay, so not the next meeting, the meeting after, which um, I haven't got the date here, but uh, I'm guessing it will be March time, something like that. 
Okay. Uh, sorry, Chair, it's likely to be February. February. Um, so if just just to make sure we don't lose sight of this one, so if, if for the February meeting we could like, um, if you guys could consider how a, a, a forum member, a very small group of forum members um, might work more closely with you just to um, explore options. Um, I think that's a really healthy um, way forward and, and makes good use of the talent um, I was going to say round the table, but across the screen as it is um, these days. Right. Um, OK. Um, are there any more questions or comments on the report as tabled? OK. In that case, what I propose to do is we move on to um, the, 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 the voting. So as ever, I'm going to need a proposer and a seconder, please. And the idea is to do it on block. So we're proposing and seconding 1.11 around the note, the DFE's proposed changes to high needs block revenue funding arrangements. We're endorsing the funding arrangements for maintained in academy special schools and independent schools. We are noting the responses that schools have made following the consultation. We are endorsing the proposed carry forward of the growth fund balances and also endorsing the proposed hourly rates for the early years providers. Right. OK, so Cher, thank you for proposing. Sharon, thank you for seconding. Um, the recommendation has been proposed and seconded. I'll now take the vote by affirmation of the meeting as permitted within the regulations. If there is no dissent, the proposal is passed. Are there any objectors to this recommendation? If you do object, please RTS now. OK. Brilliant. So that one's gone through. So thank you, Angela, and thank you all for your input on that. So um, where are we now? I think we are. We are there, are we not? Yes. Gosh. So there we go. So that concludes the meeting today. Thank you, everyone. Um, for your participation. I, it's probably a little bit early, but I will I will wish you all um, festive joys. And it's the first time I've done that. It feels a bit, it's, it's December. So, you know, whatever Christmas looks like in your world and your bubble, I should say, you know, I sincerely hope you have a, a, a lovely, relaxing time, a healthy time. We will hopefully see most of you, but not you, Mr. Levitz. Um, on the 13th of January 2021. Um, do enjoy your time off. We're almost there, guys. Thank you all, and uh, we'll see you all very, very soon. So I now need to let Peter Smith Parkin know that the live stream is about to end. So bye, everyone. Bye, David. Thanks a lot. Bye. bye. Merry Christmas. Bye, everyone. Merry Christmas. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> Bye. Yes, he is, Steve. <laughs>